Good evening. Welcome, everyone. We will give uh, all those who are joining us via social media a couple minutes to join, and then we'll get started. Varukumar, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Welcome, everyone, to MGO Live, a monthly uh, discussion of uh, several different types of topics. This is a ministry of the Mar Gregorios Orthodox Christian Student Movement, otherwise known as MGOCSM, of the Northeast American Diocese. Um, we want to have an immersive experience. So we ask that you all kindly uh, give your undivided attention as we start this uh, MGO Live for this month. Um, and today's topic is a, definitely a sensitive topic and it will be about homosexuality. Um, it is the first part of a two-part series um, which will cover homosexuality and transgenderism. And today, um, by the grace of God, we are blessed with the presence of Mr. Benjamin Cave. Benjamin Cave graduated from St. Tikhon's Orthodox Theological Seminary in 2019. Since then, he has spoken at the Oxford Patristics Conference and at various parishes and at college campuses. He has published in the Oxford Studia Patristics Christian Research Journal and elsewhere for his work on gender. He is the author of On Gender and the Soul, Exploring Gender and Its Relationship to the Soul According to the Church Fathers. And in his spare time, he runs the YouTube channel Theoria. Um, before we begin this session, um, let us begin in a word of prayer. So if I could ask all of us to bow our heads in a word of prayer. Barak Mark, O Heavenly King, the Comforter of the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere and fillest all things. Treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, O oh good one. Without further ado, I welcome our beloved speaker, Mr. Benjamin Cave. Thank you. So by way of a quick introduction, my name's Ben. I'm married. I have four kids. Uh, and I have not struggled with same-sex attraction or homosexuality. But I have struggled with a deep and abiding sense of shame. And in many cases, shame is a devastating aspect of living with same-sex attraction, especially within the confines of a church community. And so I want to present this topic or this talk not so much as a theological lecture, as a conversation and an exploration of how we can witness our faith, not just uh, not just to to those struggling with same sex attraction, but but to everyone. And I think the the best way that we can do that is first to approach um, any topic with a sense of compassion. There's a, a wonderful statement by Saint John Chrysostom that I would like to use as we begin, and to bear in mind, really, as we, we continue, and that is, is this. It is better to err by excess of mercy than by excess of severity. 
Now, the first and perhaps most important thing that I'm going to say in this entire talk this evening is that I believe the church has largely failed the LGBT community. Now, note, I'm not making a theological claim here or a theological statement, just a, a general observation. An observation that is backed up by some, some research that was done where it was reported that the LGBT community, the population, is, is the only community in the world that actually statistically gets worse when they go to church. And the question that we have to consider as Christians ourselves is why this happens. And I would like to submit that that could be a large part would be shame. And so starting out, it's absolutely vital that we acknowledge that individuals struggling with same-sex attraction or individuals struggling with anything for that matter are beloved children of God. And there are no stipulations to this. Just as you are, you are a beloved child of God, no matter what. Now, does this mean we shouldn't seek to build ourselves up and weed out things in our life that may not be helpful for us? No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that. I'm not saying, for instance, if you do meth every night, that because God loves you, that you should just keep doing that. No. And I'm also not not making any any moral statements here either. I'm simply saying that shame and this deep abiding sense of shame that many of us carry with us, whether uh, due to homosexuality or or some other some other sense of of lack in our life, some other sense, this shame is telling us a lie. The shame is telling us that we cannot be loved. But the reality is, is that at the very heart of Christianity is the love of God. And in this sense, we have to begin. Now, what is homosexuality? Homosexuality is generally defined as an attraction for someone of the same sex. So same sex attraction. And the question that it behooves us to answer, at least in the modern world, is, is it permissible for a man to love another man? Can a woman love another woman? Now, the church's teaching on this specifically only really touches one aspect, and that's that's the sexual component. And as we continue to, um, to talk about this, I just want to be very clear. Um, you know, this is a sensitive subject. It, it is. And um, the aspect of it that the church takes umbrage with is the sexual component. And sex has always been a taboo subject. And the church itself even has a lot of teaching around sex and how to engage in it uh, in, a, in a moral way, in a lawful way. And this is not restricted to individuals and same-sex relationships. It's, it's also – it spans – even people in, in marital relationships. The church teaches, for instance, that um, sexual relationships should be, should be within the context of a loving marital relationship. And that its rightful use can be determined by three, three specific things. This is what the church teaches us through the scriptures and the fathers, and that is the bearing of fruit or children. Uh, the increase of the marital union and for controlling lust. Now, what does the what does the church say about homosexuality? There are there's a handful, six, eight, maybe, of scripture references talking about the sexual aspect of same sex attraction. And some have argued that these are not referring to monogamous relationships, but because at the time of writing, there was a common practice of married men even going out and using young boys, so pedestry is what it would be called for their own pleasure, and that there is a power dynamic involved, and it wasn't consensual, it wasn't monogamous, and so on. This raises a peculiar question that in recent years, many Biblical exegetes have tried to answer in various different, in various ways, and that 
question is, is it okay if it's monogamous and consensu consensual? Could it be considered a lawful marriage of the, the same-sex couple? Now, it is true in saying that um, that many of these um, instances spoken of in Scripture are talking about non-consensual relationships and in pedestry. However, in, in the history of Christianity and the history of the world, really, it's it's never been considered a marriage. We've had historically uh, people try to make a, a case for what's called adopoiesis in Greek or what's called brother making. And there have been a handful of people saying that this tradition in the church where two men would go into the church and be bound in some way was a precursor to same-sex marriage. In 2017, a scholar named Claudia Rep actually put the kibosh on this, if you will, by writing a book um, and, and showing that adopoiesis was actually more akin to the networking bond that one makes when being the godparent of another child, and that this was used in the Byzantine world as a way to expand familial connections, not as a marriage. So now we have where we are today. Recently, 2013, I believe it was, 2013, 2015, somewhere around there, you had the legalization in America of same-sex marriages and a conflation of this term marriage, um, not just to mean one man and one woman, which is what it has been traditionally and what the church holds to, but, but it could also include one man and another man or one woman and another woman. Now, there's a, an interesting distinction here that I think we can make as Orthodox Christians and, and is actually made by Thomas Hopko, Father Thomas Hopko of Blessed Memory, in his book, Same-Sex Attraction. He would say, as Orthodox Christians, we can understand and even stand up for the civil rights of an individual or a couple, but there's not a sense that this union can be a sacramental marriage. Going back again, I want to pose a, a question, and that's what do we do about divorce? This may seem like a non sequitur, but it's not. In Matthew 5, 32, we read that Christ says, but I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she be unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery, adultery, of course, being one of the Ten Commandments. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. This is a hard, this is a hard verse. Again, that's Matthew 5:32. One of the things that makes it a difficult verse is because we know that we live in a fallen world. Now, Christ does give an exception for divorce if there's unfaithfulness or infidelity. But what if what if the husband beats the wife, beats the children relentlessly? What do we do then? The Orthodox Church, both the Oriental and Eastern Orthodox Church, we do make exceptions. But how can we make exceptions if this goes directly against the words of Christ? The understanding is that living in a fallen world, sometimes things don't work out, and it's painful. And we allow divorce because of this reality. We even allow remarriage. And remarriage is a particularly interesting one because if you look at the church's marital service, in the second marriage, provided it's the second marriage for both individuals, because it's the, if it's the first for one of the individuals, the church by economia allows the original text to be read for the sake of the person whose um, marriage, it's the first marriage. But if it's the second marriage for both individuals, the text of the church's sacramental service changes, and it emphasizes 
repentance and the controlling of lust, going so far even to say essentially that you're getting married uh, again because you cannot control yourself. Now, in rare cases, the church will allow up to three marriages total. We, gen we don't generally go beyond that, but in any case, the bishop has to approve. Not only that, but if you do get divorced, I should mention also uh, there's an ecclesiastical process where the bishop has to write off and say, yes, um, we recognize this. And so this raises a peculiar question because if, if someone, and again, I, let me be clear, I'm not making any theological statements. I'm trying to explore this topic with you. What do we do about same-sex, consensual, monogamous relationships to reduce any relationship to its sexual component is it's offensive really i mean you wouldn't do that to a heterosexual marriage reduce it exclusively to its sexual component in fact in marriage as someone who's been married for a while um there's a lot more that goes into marriage than the sexual component uh and and it's hard it can be very very hard and you know this is one of the reasons why our church emphasizes marriage as a, uh, a sacrament and as a way to meet god it's because of this self-sacrifice that has to take place and and a lot of this um you know this does not involve uh, that sexual component a lot of the time i want to point out also that in saying that the same sex sexual union is the part that the church has a problem with because it is we can also say that the church has a problem with certain things in the marriage bed there are unlawful acts that one can engage in while married not only that it is possible for someone to use their spouse for their exclusive pleasure and i hope you'll pardon my language here it's just i'm trying to be as simple and straightforward as possible it's it's possible for someone to use their wife or use their husband for their se sexual pleasure and this this also radically misses the mark and so without making any theological claims i do wonder i do wonder how how we should look at same-sex consensual monogamous relationships the church absolutely says no these are not lawful christ also says it is not lawful to divorce your wife and i'm i'm only saying this because i frankly i myself don't know don't know what to do with this um but beyond beyond this my emphasis here I want to I want to speak to people in the church specifically people in the church that are not homosexual do not have same sex attraction. Many times we like to focus on things that we don't struggle with. And we like to point the finger. And this as I said previously is is one of the reasons why I think the church has largely failed this LGBT community because it is an easy thing to pick on if that's not something that's a part of your life it's it's an easy thing because you you have no relationship to if you have no relationship to it it's an easy thing to say yes this is perverted this is wrong again it's reducing the entirety of that relationship to its sexual component And this, this as, as Christians radically misses the mark, if we ever want to make any impact in the world, we have to start with love, with compassion, and relationship. And speaking specifically to people inside the church, you have to start with relationship and relationships don't start because you condemn someone if we look at 
the uh, passage where Christ uh, walks up to the lady caught in adultery, and the Pharisees are all ready to stone her. Christ says, you know, he who's without sin, cast the first stone. And it's a short exchange, but after this, he looks down at the woman and says, neither do I condemn you. That's where he starts. That's where he starts. And then he says, "Move, go forth and sin no more. Please make note of this two-part phrase. It's, it's, one, it's, it's one or two sentences, but it is unbelievably important. Neither do I condemn you. Go forth and sin no more. As we, as we consider this topic, and as we consider how this topic has been treated by many in the church and continues to be treated by many in the church today, we would do well, again, to read through 1 Corinthians 13, which is the faint, Paul's famous passage on love. Our love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Because this is where we start. This, this is where we start. And as a church, we, we're never going to be ready to have this conversation unless we start there. I'm going to... Um, I feel like I've just prevented, or pre prevented, presented a smattering of disconnected thoughts. So I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, I really just want to ask more questions uh, than than present something that's dogmatic. Because when we think about the church, we need to understand that we have dogma. We do have dogma, and and we also have pastoral care. Dogma is based on the perfect life of Jesus Christ. Dogma is, in a sense, a revealing of the perfect God. Living in the fallen world, we don't make excuses for missing the mark or falling into sin, but we do recognize that there's a distinction here, and, and human beings are not perfect. And so when considering any issue that has to do with human beings, so any pastoral issue or anything, We need to consider this approach where we go up to the person like Christ, neither do I condemn you. And sometimes the space between that phrase and go forth and sin no more could be years. It could be years. I'm going to look at the questions that came in uh, so I don't um, get too distracted here by just kind of thinking out loud with all of you. Um, and, uh, I guess read them off and then, and then try to respond as best I can. I have close friends I grew up with that identify as gay. And although I wasn't, it wasn't affecting our relationship before, I see now how our values and views conflict. How do I show the love of Christ without making them feel like they are judged? What can I do to not lose the years of friendship. Our, our starting principles are going to be different. Uh, many times when we have friends that take a different view than us, uh, we are starting from a different foundation. Many times, not always. And the only thing that we can do in such cases is, you know, having a long theological conversation or philosophical talk about the right and the wrong and the true and the beautiful and the good and all these things. It's not really going to do anything. I, you know, I, I believe that in order for us, and this may be, you can let me know what you think about this and disregard it if it's nonsense, but I think in order for us to show the love of Christ uh, to, to individuals in the LGBT community, mainly because of the way the church, and I'm not speaking exclusively the Orthodox Church right now. I'm speaking the way that people that go by the name Christian 
have treated this community. It's so ingrained in, in a kind of cultural milieu that of hatred or perceived hatred that in any kind of pushing back on this is going to, um, you know, it could result in uh, um, some 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 defensiveness, really, and and the way we show Christ to these individuals is is really by a, a kind of martyrdom. Like I truly believe that when when Christians start dying for their brothers and sisters who are gay, then we might be able to go somewhere. But until that happens, I don't I don't know what to say. So I would just say, you know, don't do anything that compromises your own integrity or your values, uh, but don't, don't judge them. Don't, um, you know, just, just continue in friendship. I hope that's helpful. What is the teaching? Here's another couple of questions. What is the church's teaching on how a previously homosexually identifying person is supposed to live a life in Christ? There's a couple of different answers here. Some would say go into monasticism. Some would say live a celibate life in the parish. Uh, it depends on calling. It depends. It depends on calling, um, and that's something that has to be discerned. Because just as someone who is heterosexual that can't find a spouse that agrees to marry them shouldn't go into monasticism for that reason, I would say the same thing of of someone with same-sex attraction. It has to be a, a specific calling, not a reaction to that. I think it's important to find a very vibrant community, a community that can, can recognize without judgment the struggles, the sadness, the loneliness, and help through that and be involved in that community. And talking to to your priest and and things like this. Another question: What should our response be when a, in a group of friends, when a group of friends has conflicting beliefs regarding homosexuality? Again, we can talk as much as we want, and many times we will never convince anyone. You know what convinces people? When I was naked, you clothed me. When I thirst, you gave me something to drink. When I was hungry, you fed me. These are the things. This is a different way than we commonly think about it, but this is speaking truth when we, when we embrace these actions of love. This is speaking truth on a, on a level that resonates at the deepest part of our being. And only when we start that way can we have that dialectic, that dialectical conversation and it be received in any way. Because we have to understand that the truth can be the truth, but the way we present it matters. How do we respond to people disparaging Christianity as a whole because of a group or a person that has misinterpreted? or misrepresented the faith? This is a hard question. And, you know, hopefully, I, I can't remember who said it. It might have been Gandhi, but he's like, or maybe it was someone else. I don't be the change you want to see in the world. Like, we have to, we have to begin to building up community as alternatives to some of these things that we are, are seeing. Because the reality is, it's a lot. It's easy for us to remain silent, silent in the way of um, speaking too much. You know, you can you can be silent by speaking too much. Let me see if I can explain. Um, it's easy to toe the line and to give uh, yes and no answers. No, we can't do this. Yes, we can do this. But that's not how the church operates. Um, even in the fasting cycle, the church operates under pastoral guidance and pastoral care. And so instead of reiterating these things in black and white ways, we have to build personal relationship. That's the only way forward, building personal relationship. And 
this relationship being founded on the eternal love of God and showing that forth uh, through our actions, our faith, our beliefs, our talk. How do we as Orthodox Christians reconcile our beliefs with that of the liberal majority? How do we withstand scrutiny of being considered a bigot or homophobic because of our beliefs? You know, the, for the most part, the longer you're in the world, well, let me go back. You have to develop a thick skin, and it's not something that happens overnight. It's hard. It's hard because what you will find is if you try to take a compassionate approach, if you try to take an approach based in relationship and love, one that doesn't uh, call out these brothers and sisters that are struggling, that are struggling with shame, with difficulties in a different way, you will have people in your own community start scrutinizing you. And you'll get it on both sides. You'll get it from the liberal majority, and you'll get it from the uh, the 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 conservative majority. And it could be even be in your parish. And this is a very hard thing to withstand. It's a very hard thing, and I I don't think we reconcile our beliefs. Again, so much of our talk of belief or faith is 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 it's all focused here this is not where things get worked out very often you know things get worked out here and people are are met you know people 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 are moved by an act of christ-like love and christ gave the sermon on the mount he did but that's not all he did he went to the cross and this is what we have to do as well. We have to go to the cross. Why are we talking about homosexuality and why is it important to discuss? I think it's important to discuss mainly because I feel, again, that we have done a disservice to the LGBT community. A disservice in increasing that shame, that shame on a core level. Now, we can talk about shame more like in Orthodox theology. We talk about bearing shame in confession, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the kind of shame that eats away at the core of your being, the kind of shame that tells you that you are worthless, that there is nothing in the world that is going to alleviate this pain, that you might as well give up. This is the kind of shame I'm talking about. And as a church, we have... We have contributed to this we have contributed to this and it's important to discuss because we can't keep doing this we have to change our approach and i'm not saying change our theology and you know you can have people take clips of this you know and try to um misconstrue what i'm trying to say I'm not saying we change theology i'm saying we change our our approach what is homosexuality what does it look like in daily life Again, homosexuality is uh, attraction for someone of the same sex. What does it look like in daily life? Generally speaking, um, homosexuality is, you know, uh, individuals that are, are male and homosexual tend to have a more um, feminine personality traits. Um, and and vice vice versa. Is it wrong to love the same gender? Didn't Christ teach love? See, this is where this is where, of course, I will again bear scrutiny because I don't think it is wrong to love someone of the same sex. The question that the church asks us or really tells us is it comes down to that sexual component. There's a, a Anglican named Wesley Hill, I believe. He wrote a couple of books, Washed in Waiting. He's a homosexual man who is committed to celibacy. Washed in Waiting is one of his books, and Spiritual Friendship is another one of his books. It is possible, there's a precedent for this, even in Christian heterosexual marriage, to live without that sexual component. Can people, Can is that for everyone? No, it's not. But 
there is a sense in which in which this could be a life-giving and fruitful relationship, even between two members of the same sex. Again, I will bear the scrutiny that comes with saying this. I do want to point out as well that be fruitful and multiply, as it says in Genesis, was interpreted by St. Gregory the Theologian, so St. Gregory Natsianzen, not only as being physical childbirth, but also be fruitful in the virtues and multiply. I'm not hurting anyone by my homosexuality, so why is it wrong? Isn't it just love? This is a difficult question because, you know, there's not a lot of context here. I think that feeling deep shame is something that the evil one wants for us. I'm saying that there is an aspect in which there could be a life-giving relationship between two men or two women. It's really the church, like it does also with the heterosexual relationship, that draws the line at the genital sexuality. And I, I don't know what to tell you about this, if I'm being honest, because I, this is, you know, this is not, um, it's not easy to talk anonymously. Let's just say that. Um, but if you do want to get in touch after and talk one on one, that would be fine with me. Um, or, you know, speaking to your priest would always be a, a good idea as well. What resources does the church provide to help me overcome my homosexuality? See, this is a good question. You know, and so living under the conviction that you need to overcome or live a celibate life is a very noble cross to bear. It is, and it's not an easy one. But I think perhaps the methodology should be changed a little bit. Um, I think it's, it's very easy to focus on getting rid of something and just be bothered by it and, and for it to become a, an obsession of sorts. And it, this contributes to a cycle of shame and sin and difficulty. And so instead of focusing on overcoming homosexuality, I'm not saying don't bear that cross. What I'm saying is don't have that be your focus. Have your focus be Christ. Because we can have a field full of large boulders, and we can focus on trying to move those boulders so that we can sow the seed in the field and produce a bountiful harvest. But we are not the ones that can move those boulders by ourselves. We are not the ones that can, by our own strength, overcome things. And so looking to Christ does two things. One, it takes us the focus off of some perceived lack in your own self. And Christ will Christ Christ will help move those boulders. And at the same time he will he will help sow the seed and have the rain fall and have the sun come. And so I think, you know, in, in seeking to overcome homosexuality, it's important, it's important that Christ is at the focus of that because, you know, our Lord loves you so much just the way you are. And he is moved, moved by your question, I would say. You know, this is this is uh, this is something. This is a hard thing to bear. It's a hard thing to ask, and I I uh, I would focus on that. How much Christ loves you, and and go forth from there. If a gay friend invites us to his or her wedding, is it permissible for us to attend? 
I don't believe the church has said anything specifically about this. I do know that if you're clergy, the rules are different, but if you're laity, um, there's not, there's not an official word on this. And I feel free to correct me, Father, if I'm wrong, but um, again, focusing on relationship um, permissible. I, I think it would be, I, th I do. A lot of times people say that homosexuality is a feeling or evil passion that we need to fight against, but there are numerous people who genuinely feel like they were made that way. How does the church respond to this? There was a debate um, about a decade ago, maybe 15 years ago, in the Christian world about how to understand same-sex attraction. Is there someone born with it, or is it a perversion that can be overcome? Is it something that someone lives with no matter what? And can't overcome. And a lot of people would say, back then at least, that homosexuality is merely a perversion and it's not, you know, you just have to overcome it. That's why we got into, you know, not not me personally, but the church started emphasizing, uh, mainly the Protestant church, started emphasizing conversion therapy where you would go through intense sessions and try to, try to um, arouse uh, feelings of heterosexual love. That was a disaster. It was an absolute disaster. My understanding from a lot of this, and it's not every single case, is that um, is that this is this is something that is is lifelong in many many cases, and just like um, yeah, just like my my uh, heterosexual orientation if you will so how we respond i guess is we just again focus on relationship and and go forth go forth in that way you know an evil passion anything can be a passion you know you can have lust inside a marital relationship lust that is uh destructive even and so it is um it's a difficult difficult topic but i do appreciate the questions i think that's all of the questions um i hope i didn't present anything super heretical and if i did please disregard it um but i i guess i guess that's all i have well thank you so much um we appreciate you joining us um and providing a very insightful answers to, uh, as we mentioned, a very sensitive topic. So uh, thank you for providing that. Um, and we hope to see you soon as we will be um, having you back in July. Um, so uh, looking forward to that. Um, with that, um, I want to um, again thank Mr. Benjamin Cave um, for uh, providing that insight. We will be, as I mentioned, um, in July, having the second part, um, which will focus on transgenderism, that will be on July 14th. So please mark your calendars um, as we will be back on MGO Live. Um, we will be um, addressing even more questions then. So uh, please feel free to continue to submit your questions. Um, this, as the, Ben has mentioned, um, we want this to be as immersive and uh, engaging as possible and address the questions that you all have. Um, and uh, and MGOCSM is doing um, a, a great job with trying to address such sensitive topics. Um, and speaking of MGO Live, next month we will also be continuing another series, the third part of uh, another MGO Live series that will be on intimacy and marriage, um, which will be led by Father Sean Thomas and his wife, Miss Lijan Kuchima, Lijan Thomas Kuchima, um, who is who are both also seminary graduates, um, and we'll be continuing that series. So looking forward to both of these sessions. Um, and before we um, close out, as many of you know, um, and and for Ben also, um, recently uh, our Metropolitan had to go back to India, unfortunately, because his mother had passed away. Um, so um, to respect her memory and uh, allowing her memory to be eternal, we're going to ask that we keep a moment of silence um, and give up an offer of prayer to God for the soul of Miss, Mrs. Susie George.
Let us close with the word of prayer. Marakmar, O Holy Father, guard us by your sacred name. O Son of God, our Savior, protect us with your victorious cross. O Holy Spirit, make us worthy tumbles of your holy habitation. O Lord, our God, forever shelter us under your divine wings at all times, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you again, Ben, and looking forward to seeing you in July. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, this does not happen without your participation. So looking forward to seeing all of you again shortly in June and July. We 